Thank you. Thank you very much. And thank you, Pierre, for inviting me. Thank you, Daphne, for being such a wonderful host. I have to apologize again for all of this problem with the sound. I have a voice disability. At some point during this lecture, my voice will reduce to gravelly croaks, and there's nothing I can do about it. So I hope you'll be tolerant and patient. Um, it doesn't hurt. It just, it's a, it's a, I have a paralyzed vocal cord, and it prevents me from making sound. All right, now this is my topic, and I worded the title this way because the way I want to frame my research is in terms of experience and the mind. So I'm going to suggest that bilingualism is an experience. It's one of the many, many things that happen to us that leave its trace on our minds and brains, a very special kind of trace in this case. There's a large body of research on experience, and a lot of it is not very surprising. So we know that everything we do, the mind, the brain, are constantly restructured by experience, and most of it is not surprising. So in terms of the mind, which I'm using as a proxy for behavioral studies, we know that architects have better visual spatial skills than non-architects, video game players have better uh, perceptual motor control than non-video players, and recently, I find this one um, interesting, soccer players have better creative fluency than non-soccer players. How odd is that? Well, here's the study. They, this was done someplace in Europe, I can't remember where, Scandinavia, I think. So they, they took soccer players who were in the high division league, and that's the HD, and soccer players who were in the lower division league, presumably because there were soccer players, okay? And there's men and women uh, plotted separately in red and blue. Interestingly, the men are in blue anyway. <laughs> and then they gave them a test of creative fluency, which is a kind of uh, executive function test, and they report significant differences. So people who play soccer at a higher level have better creative executive control than worse soccer players. I just reported. There's also evidence showing actual changes in the brain itself. So musicians have enhancements of certain parts of the Cortex, London taxi drivers famously have enlarged hippocampi in the region responsible for spatial navigation. Now, all of those examples uh, suffer from the same inherent flaw. Who develops these skills? Who becomes an architect? Who spends their life playing video games? You can argue that there is a circularity because you don't really know which is cause and which is effect. Well, bilinguals, bilingualism is also an intense experience in which one ends up using their mind and brain. But unlike all those other experiences, particularly in Canada, and I refer proudly to the census report that came out yesterday, bilinguals are not pre-selected. By and large, here at least, people become bilingual because life makes them bilingual. Because their parents are immigrants or whatever. So here we have a case where there's an intense cognitive experience. We can assess how people do on various kinds of measures, but we can also be sure that as far as possible they were not pre-selected. Now this is not random assignment to groups. And I can tell you, I've had re uh, reviewers complain about papers that I've submitted because they say, oh, but the bilinguals, they were just different because they weren't randomly assigned to groups. So you can't do that. I think ethics um, boards would have a lot of trouble if we go in and remove babies from their parents to <laughs> randomly assign them to groups. So this situation presents a case where we can actually test how experience affects the mind much more dramatically than we can 
with any of the other experiences. So in bilingualism, and in particular, bilingualism in the way I'm describing it, where people didn't choose to be bilingual, modifies the mind. We, we can begin to understand how experience-induced plasticity works. Okay, you with me? That's the context. And that's the big question that I want all of the research that I'm going to report to you to address. So who's bilingual? It's an interesting thing because it's not a categorical variable. It's a continuum. We have people who are more or less bilingual, especially in Montreal. Now, if we say, well, we really understand what bilingualism means, we can say, well, a bilingual person is someone who can speak in two different ways, control of two different systems. That's clear. We can also say we know what the other end point is. A monolingual, well, there's a monolingual. Somebody who can't even imagine <laughs> that there's another way to say something. So those are the end points. But what do we do with everybody else? <laughs> so we have, a, we have variation in the experience. So in some of the studies I'm going to talk to you about, we try to make categorical, we, f we try to force categorical divisions so we can compare a group we call monolingual and a group we call bilingual. But in at least one of the studies I'm going to talk about, we don't do that. And we'll just let it vary across the spectrum. Here's the basic story about how bilingualism works in the mind. What happens to a bilingual mind that's different. Speak first about language representations. What do we know, what do bilinguals know about language? And it's become clear now that just basic control of linguistic representations are weaker. They're not the same as they are for monolinguals. Here's a simple illustration. We measured English receptive vocabulary scores in monolinguals and bilinguals. These are standard scores. It's just a measure of how much English you know, okay? We're not measuring what they also know about their other language. So keep in mind that what I show you for the bilinguals is only part of their story. Now we did it with children. We had over 1,700 children who completed this test. And what you can see is the blue lines for bilinguals and the red lines for monolinguals both show perfectly normal distributions for vocabulary. Now this is a, the Peabody picture vocabulary test, so the population mean is 100. And what you see is there's just a little shift. So the monolingual curve is a little bit better than the population. The bilingual curve is a little bit lower. But it's all normal. That's important. But there's a significant shift. So on average, monolingual kids, or monolingual English speakers, know more English words than their classmates who go home and speak Portuguese or uh, whatever. We did the same thing with adults and got, oh, you got nothing. Mm -hmm. Wow. <sighs> oh, I pressed the wrong button and I turned the computer off. Okay. All right, I don't know what's happened to that. It disappeared, you see? Or you'd have to take my word for it. It's virtually identical. How long is that? We believe you. Thank you. <laughs> Do you want to review my next paper? <laughs> All right. Uh, All right. All right. In addition to having somewhat smaller vocabulary, they they're slower to name pictures, slower to retrieve names. So overall, they have reduced lexical linguistic resources, less linguistic automaticity, 
Therefore, linguistic processing for bilinguals is more effortful. What about language use? Well, here's the key insight to all of the explanation about bilingualism. It is now abundantly clear that bilinguals, when bilingual is using one language, the other language is always active to some extent. There is always joint activation, always. It can be to a higher or lower threshold, but there is always joint activation. And the evidence comes from behavioral imaging and patient studies, and it's very conclusive. This means that there's a problem. So when bilinguals are trying to create an utterance, they face a problem that monolinguals don't face, which is the um, active um, interference, potential interference from the other language. And we see in bilingual speech, there's slower word retrieval, there's more errors, and there's more gaps. So the entire mental picture is different for bilinguals than monolinguals in simple language use. This conflict from the other language makes cognitive processing more effortful. Okay? So now bilingualism is looking like a really bad thing. It's harder to speak, it's harder to think, everything is harder. What's going on? Well, because of this conflict, the bilingual mind has to develop a means of handling with it so that it can speak uh, fluently, efficiently, without intrusions from the other language, which we know bilinguals do all the time. And so the way we believe this happens is that the executive control system that's sitting around in the front part of the brain, whose job it is to resolve conflict, pay attention to what's important, ignore what is not, is brought in, recruited into all language processing. So now language processing is handled not only by all the regular linguistic pathways, but the executive control system is attached as well. This constant involvement of the executive control system changes it. It's a different system. It's used now for a whole other range of problems. Here's a picture of what I'm saying. So let's say that is a kind of a representational system for a first language. If you're bilingual, there's two of them, and they're jointly activated. So you have two active representation systems that may overlap, they may not overlap, none of that really matters. All that matters is that they are jointly activated. We also know that there's gaps because we saw there's smaller vocabulary for bilingual. So there's reduced choice and there's also conflict. In this case, there's an L1 and L2 item that are competing for selection. So this is the picture and what it leads to is well, let's start at the bottom. Those reductions I was talking about in lexical production, slower to name words and so forth, but crucially, an enhancement in executive control. Enhancement because that system is used with this language system. So it's used infinitely more by bilinguals than it is by modern. I want to start just with a little snapshot of what this means for metalinguistic ability. And I've chosen this because metalinguistic ability is, uh, is an area that brings together linguistic and executive control abilities. It's, it's sort of the intersect of these two domains. So I'm going to show you this example to illustrate what I mean. So metalinguistic awareness or performance on metalinguistic awareness tasks requires language proficiency, which I've been calling representation, and I will call throughout, so kind of keep that in mind, and executive control or control. And we've seen in 
lot of research, the bilinguals better generally do better. There's a lot of research from the 1980s with children that these tasks are, in fact, solved better by bilingual children than bilingual children. One task that I worked with for a while with children um, was a grammaticality judgment where we asked children to only make a judgment about the grammatical well-formedness of a sentence, ignore the meaning. So you have sentences like apples growed on trees, that's wrong, and children have to say no, that's wrong. But we train children to only comment on the grammar, so we give them sentences like apples grow on noses, and that's okay. So what they have to do is selectively attend to the grammar and resist this very salient, compelling uh, other piece of information because that's not what the rule is. And this is really hard for kids to do. They want to jump out of they jump out of their seats quite literally and say, no, apples don't grow on noses. So it's very hard. And the reason it's hard is because of control. So the first kind of sentence tests knowledge of grammar. Can they detect the error? And the second kind of sentence tests control of attention. And again, I'm going to highlight this distinction throughout, uh, knowledge versus control. So what we find is that bilingual children are better on these control items than monolingual children, and everybody is equivalent on the knowledge items. That's been replicated a number of times. We even um, show that same effect with adults by using ERP to measure their brain responses, and we saw the same pattern. So these items where um, they need control and attention to say that the grammar is okay produce a higher inhibition peak in um, bilingual adults in the world. Okay. So that's the way they in these ideas intersect for now. But the more dramatic results are from non-verbal tasks, things that have nothing to do with language. So again, I want to underline why this is really dramatic. On that first slide where I showed you all of those different experiences and their consequences, the outcomes were always related to the experience. So architects are better at visuospatial tasks. That's what they do all day. Okay? I'm going to now argue that bilingualism, a language experience, shows its greatest effect in a completely non-linguistic domain. Not what they do all day. Not a direct extension of their daily experience. Now, the executive control literature, I'm going to skip that, it's starting late, I'll just go back to the experiment. I'm going to show you two little experiments uh, to illustrate um, these nonverbal advantages. These two little experiments I've chosen both happen to be with children, but we have other similar things with adults, some of which I think you'll see later. All right, global local. Here's a problem that requires executive control. And I will show you the problem, but first I'll say I'm going to report data from three different studies with six-year-olds. We did the experiment three times. Um, how many replications does it take to persuade reviewers that the effect is real? The answer is three. Mm -hmm. Now, we show children stimuli, so they'll see either a stimulus like a letter F, H or a letter S, there were other stimuli too, like a circle or a square, just on a screen in the center. And they are asked to press one button if they see an H and the other button if they see an S. And they're very good at it. And again, the monolinguals are in red and the bilinguals are in blue. And they can all do this equally quickly. So, no problems. Now the relevant stimuli don't look like that. They have two, they're hierarchical. So here you have a capital H 
made up of little H's, and we can ask children to either press the button showing what the big letter is or what the little letters are. This is a congruent item because it doesn't matter which one you're looking at. And if we give kids just a bunch of these congruent items where there's two levels, again, they're exactly the same. So it doesn't matter if you're asking for the little letter or the big letter, modeling with bilingual children are exactly the same. Now there's no executive control so far. Executive control is brought in when there's conflict. When there's two responses that could be applied, you have to attend to the right part of the stimulus in order to make the right response. And you have to inhibit the response that would go to the other stimulus. So in the full experiment, we show children these two kinds of stimuli mixed in to a presentation. The congruent ones that I've shown you, but incongruent ones as well. Now, on these incongruent ones, if the instruction is to press the key showing what the big letter is, then the right answer is H. But if the instruction is to press the key showing what the little letter is, then the right answer is S. So you have to selectively attend and inhibit the other response. That requires executive control. In addition, we present these in a mixed block. So you have to switch, you have to monitor, and you have to hold the rule in mind. This is a very heavy dose of executive control. All right, so we gave these items to children three times, three different experiments. I'll put up all the results. And the first thing you'll notice that the results from all three experiments are pretty well identical. These are reaction time data. So in all cases, the monolingual children take longer than the bilingual children to provide the response for both kinds of problems. This is perfectly replicated in all three experiments. And you'll recall that all of these children were equivalent on the conditions where there was no executive control. So they're only faster if the task requires executive control. I need you a second quick example to show that you can you can get that system involved in a number of different ways and the result is the same. This is a funny task. Um, these were these kids were eight years old. We always give them background stuff and they're always the same. And we had about 30 kids in each group. This is a class, this is a task where we're going to ask kids to make classification judgments. Now in one condition, they're looking at the computer screen. And they have to, they're going to see a picture, and they have to press one key if the picture is an animal, and a different key if the picture is a musical instrument. Okay? So they see things like this, and they press the key. And they do that for a while. Then we give them an auditory task. Uh, they're still in front of the computer, but now they're going to hear stimuli through headphones. And every stimulus they hear, they have to say whether the sound is an animal or a musical instrument. Let's we'll see if these play. Not at all. I can't hear them at all. No, it doesn't matter. So some of these are animals and some of these are musical instruments. No. Okay. I have a microphone for you. You do? Yes. I appreciate it. <laughs> So well, what we see is that um, this is the these are percentage correct, and all the kids are getting 90% of the responses correct. Monolinguals and bilinguals are identical, and it doesn't matter if they're doing the visual task or the auditory task; they're identical. Again, there's no executive control. You respond to the stimulus. There's no executive. How do we put in executive control? We tell them to do these two things at the same time. 
now there's a lot of executive control. So on each trial, they simultaneously see a picture and hear an auditory stimulus and have to respond to both. And that requires a lot of planning and monitoring and switching. Very hard task. So now how do they do? We see that their the bilingual children are now getting more of a mind. So when you make it hard by bringing in the executive control system, the mom, everybody gets worse. It's a ridiculous task. But the monolingual children lose much more. Okay. So that's the summary. And those are some examples. And what I would conclude from that is that these benefits that we're seeing are found in a completely different domain under circumstances where we can rule out other initial differences. These kids perform the baseline conditions equivalently. It's only when executive control is added that the bilingual children are better. <coughs> I think this is just in time. <laughs> Hello, can you hear me? Really? Seriously? I don't believe you. You know what happens, even though... Oh, yeah. Yeah, that is yeah. working. Oh, yeah. That is so much better. Can you try? You can hear me now, can't you? Is that better? Is that better? You know what happens, even though I know I can't project, when I see when I try to project, and it's very hard to prevent yourself, I'm trying to project, and that and it just makes my voice that much worse. Okay, good. Thank you. All right, I want to follow this up and just look at a couple of sort of outline questions. And this is one that many people ask. So does it matter? Do you get the same benefit if your two languages are very similar, like English and French, um, or when they're very different, like English and Chinese? So we had a look at this with the former graduate student of mine, Luluka Barrett. Here's her sample. She had monolingual kids. These kids were all six years old. Chinese, English, French, English, and Spanish, English, bilinguals. Uh, they were all the same age. They were all from the same SES stratum. Um, and they had absolutely comparable background scores on everything that we measured. Now the sample, as you can figure out yourself, had these characteristics. Chinese um, kids have a different writing system. Um, we're being educated in English like the monolingual kids that spoke Chinese at home. The French kids were being educated in French, so they were French dominant. But the writing system is alphabetic like English, so there isn't a big gap there. And the Spanish kids spoke Spanish at home, perfectly bilingual, English in school. So they're being educated in the language in which we are testing them, which is really important. And of course, Spanish is written in the Roman alphabetic language. So you can see there's a lot of things going on in this sample. We gave kids verbal tasks, a vocabulary test. And we can see that the Spanish kids scored as well as the monolinguals, and the other two, the French and the Chinese, were significantly lower in their scores, but not their normal scores. These are perfectly normal scores. They're just lower than their classmates, who are monolingual or Spanish. They gave them a test of grammatical knowledge. And again, the Spanish kids are doing really well. The other kids, less so, but fine. Um, a morphosyntactic test, the Woods test, you know, this is a lot of, you know, that stuff, right? And here, the Spanish kids are performing significantly better than everybody else. I think that's the last one here. So, all of these factors are important. What language schooling is in, how similar the languages are. We get different results on every test, and they can all be explained. I'm not going to bore you with a detailed explanation. But every one of these 
differences can be explained in terms of one of those experiences. And we gave them a nonverbal executive control test. Okay? No language. And they went like this. They look at the computer and they see these two images. And then on each trial, a stimulus shows up with the cue. So that cue, that blobby thing, means it's a touch screen tablet computer. Touch the item that matches it by shape. On, on half the items, it would be a little color wheel, and they would have to touch the item that matches it by color. So this creates um, two scores that are well known in the executive control literature relating to task switching. <clears throat> One of these scores <coughs> is called local switch cost. It's the ability to do a switch trial and then a non-switch trial and then a switch trial. There's no executive control involved. You just have to perform these different trials. And if the uh, trial is different from the previous one, it always takes a little longer, not because of any executive control. It's just because of resetting. Local switch costs don't change with age. Old people show the same magnitude as young people. It's not an executive control measure. So when we looked at the four groups, indeed we found no differences. The other uh, variable you can take from a switching task is called global switch. This is the difference between doing a whole block of trials where they're always going to be the same and you know they're always going to be the same. That's called a non-switch block. Versus doing those non-switch trials in the context of the possibility that you will have a different kind of trials. You have to hold in mind the other rule and so on. That's a well-known measure of executive control. It changes dramatically with age. <clears throat> See, I'm losing my voice anyway. Um, in that these global switch costs are very large in young people and in older people and very small in young adults. Um, that's the typical pattern for executive control. So now we have six-year-old kids. What is their executive control measure in global switch costs going to be? And here we have the monolingual cost and then the other three groups. There's zero difference between the other three groups. The monolinguals are having a harder time. So all the bilingual kids are better, equivalent to each other, and better than the monolinguals. So the, the summary is very simple. Do language pairs matter? Yes, for linguistic, linguistic and non-linguistic and literacy outcomes. It matters very much what your other language is. But no for nonverbal executive control. And the reason is that part of the system, that part of the advantage, is identical. It doesn't matter if your two languages are English and Chinese or English and Spanish. What matters is every time you speak, your executive control system gets involved and it has changed as a result. So it's that part of it that matters. Um, what time do you want me to end? Since I started a bit late, I can you know, sort of skip through some stuff. Yeah, uh, so uh, uh, Twenty minutes? Okay. Minutes? okay. Um, all right, I'm going to show you this one, and then I'm going to skip to the next part. How, how bilingual do you have to be? Now, I showed you at the beginning that bilingualism is a continuum, so I want to come back to that point. We did a study in two different immersion schools. And I want to stress, I mean, we didn't do these two studies um, thinking that there was any connection between them. We did each of these studies for separate reasons and then came back to the data <coughs> later and saw what I'm going to show you. So study one is done in a Hebrew day school where kids are instructed most but not all of the day in Hebrew. Uh, the kids we looked at are seven to nine years old. Um, study two is part of the data, 
it says French immersion. It isn't really French immersion. It's a private French school uh, for Anglophone children where all the instruction is in French. It's much more intense than standard French immersion. Now, what's important about these two programs is the massive diversity in the kids. The kids basically can come and go in these programs as they like. They don't all start at the beginning. They come in at different times. So they've all been in the program for a different length of time. These kids can speak different languages at home. So there's a lot of stuff that's moving around. So we didn't do a standard comparison study. We did a multivariate regression study. What in these background experiences can we see to predict outcomes? And I'm going to look at two kinds of outcomes, metalinguistic outcomes and nonverbal executive control outcomes. All right? Now remember in the study I just showed you, metalinguistic outcomes should matter very much um, in terms of the language profile, the language experiences. Whereas these nonverbal executive control outcomes should only reflect bilingualism. Because these two studies were done independently, these kids are in different kinds of programs, and to make it really messy, we use different tasks. There's no overlap. We used a different set of tasks in each study. So, study one with Hebrew immersion. And, but here's what's the same. For all of these data, we have the child's age, nonverbal intelligence, English vocabulary, the relation between their proficiency in the two languages. So for Hebrew, we calculated a score um, showing their Hebrew vocabulary as a proportion of their English vocabulary. So the more that approach is one, the more bilingual they are, and how much time they've been in the program, okay? Uh, for the metalinguistic task, we used the WUGS uh, morphology task, and we could predict almost 40% of the variants, and all of the variants came from age, uh, nonverbal intelligence, and vocabulary. For the, uh, there's a pie chart picture, so this purple is the combination of the language and IQ measures. For the um, nonverbal executive control, we used a flanker task, which is a simple conflict task. We could explain 25% of the variants, and all of it came from how bilingual they were and how long they've been in the program. So that's that, okay? Study two, the French study. It's that, you know, apples grow on noses. Again, we're explaining 40% of the variants. And again, it's from a language measure. So there's the picture. And this time we used uh, that global, global thing I showed you. I uh, know, well, yeah, that's right, it was the global, local thing. Completely different measure. We could explain 30% of the variants, which is similar to the other study. And it all came from how much time they were in the program. Now put this together. And what you have, I think, is a remarkable replication. Different kids, different kinds of language program, and completely different tasks. And what we see is that ability to perform a metalinguistic task depends on language proficiency and intelligence, whereas ability to perform an executive control task depends on how bilingual you are. Again, a perfect script. So, this is a dissociation. Language proficiency leads to metalinguistic outcomes. Immersion experience leads to executive control outcomes. And I'm going to come back to that distinction I introduced earlier. And I'll insert words that I used 30 years ago because it's incredible when you do some do a study and find out something you said 30 years ago still works. And just to prove it, I first <laughs> made the distinction in 1978, extended it to cognitive development in 1993, and more recently have used it to explain lifetime cognitive change. Okay. Now, um, 
You know what? Okay, I'm going to ask you now because I should finish up in about 15 minutes. I, you know what? I'm going to I'm going to do this. I'm just going to go through it really quickly. So this next section is a bit of the explanation, and I'm going to go through it quickly, and I will be happy to take questions at the end. So I'm not trying to fudge the brain data. I just want to show you. All right. Why are these differences? Okay. Number one. As I said earlier, the constant need to manage attention because of jointly activated languages recruits the executive control system. How do I know that? Well, I know it because um, Gigi Luck, who was my most brilliant ever PhD student, did a meta-analysis of 10 uh, fMRI studies um, showing that the regions of the brain used for language switching in a simple switching task, name these pictures in one language, then name them in the other language, those regions are exactly the same as the standard executive control network that everyone has acknowledged. It's the same network. So when you name um, a picture uh, on one trial as dog and on the next trial as chien, you are using exactly the same system that is acknowledged to be the executive control system. So that's how I know that's true. Second, this cognitive, this use of the system to resolve language conflict changes that system. It reorganizes it so it looks different. How do we know? Well, there's again the brilliant Gigi Look who did a study, uh, but there's a few other studies as well. Now, these data are hard to understand, but you're going to have to trust me here. This is, a, this is a simple flanker task that monolingual and bilingual adults did in fMRI. These green bars simply show which brain networks are being used, okay? So to make it simple, let's not care what those brain networks are. But here's what's important. On congruent trials, this is really small, you can't see the light green is monolingual and the dark green is bilingual. On congruent trials, monolinguals and bilinguals are using the same brain network. Remember, congruent, congruent trials, there's no problem. Incongruent trials, where there's conflict, the monolinguals and bilinguals are using different brain networks. So again, without caring at this level about what those regions are, what's important here is that bilinguals are solving these incongruent conditions that require conflict by using a different brain system. And finally, this reconfigured network is quite simply more efficient. Okay, now, normally I get invited to give talks because all people really want to hear about is what I'm going to do now. So here you go, you've, you've earned your dessert. The, um, the issue is how broad is the impact? So we've seen a generalized enhancement of executive control. And although I didn't show you any of these data, we have studies showing that those executive control benefits on nonverbal conflict tasks are present throughout the lifespan in older adults as well as in children and uh, younger adults. But what happens to older adults when cognitive aging is not going so well? Is there still any protection from my All right, so the, I have to say, you know, the first study we did, which I'll show you in a minute, it was an incredible long shot because everything I've told you so far argues that the advantage of bilingualism is in executive control. But dementia is primarily a memory disorder. Why would there be any benefit? It really was a long shot. Oh, we looked at this. Now, um, the first two studies were based on clinic records. We never saw any of these people. We took data from the hospital records. 
and tried to create samples that were comparable in many ways. Uh, the first study was published in 2007, <clears throat> and two-thirds of the patients had Alzheimer's disease, and one-third had other kinds of dementia, but we still excluded all sorts. We excluded vascular dementia, which is dementia from stroke and so forth. So two-thirds of them were pretty coherent. One-third was a bit heterogeneous. So in the second study, uh, which we published a couple of years ago, all the patients had probable AD, so more homogeneous. And here's what we found. We looked at, we had almost 100 in each group in the first study. Um, year's duration is important because we asked the family, well, we took from the records when the family claimed symptoms were first observed and when the diagnosis was made. And the year's duration is the difference between those estimates. It's important because you might think that some kinds of people, maybe immigrants, maybe people who are not, you know, monolingual speakers of English, would wait longer before seeking medical treatment. And therefore, when they showed up at the clinic, they would be older just because they waited longer. We can see here that if anything, the monolinguals are waiting a little longer, but the difference isn't significant. Years of formal education is important because there's a lot of literature showing formal education protects against cognitive decline. So the more formal education you have, the more protected you are. Here we have a significant difference. The monolinguals are more protected. So they should be more resilient and not show symptoms of dementia as early as bilinguals, right? MMSE is a very rough, 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 rough measure of cognitive level, um, and everybody's the same. Okay, how old are they? The bilinguals are four years old. It's highly significant. So we did study two. Um, we just went back to the same clinic and took patient records over the next few years. <clears throat> All of these patients are AD, so it's much more homogeneous. We have just over 100 in each group. Everything looks exactly the same, right? And when we look at how old they are, we also replicate the result. So across the roughly 400 patients, we have a substantial effect in which bilinguals display symptoms of Alzheimer's disease or other dementias later than monolinguals. <clears throat> so I'm going to plot that here um, as now, not the onset of symptoms, but as the age of diagnosis, which is much more objective. So bilinguals are significantly older when they are diagnosed. Study one is two-thirds Alzheimer's, study two is all Alzheimer's. Now, before people actually are diagnosed with Alzheimer's or dementia, there's a stage that often comes up called mild cognitive impairment. A huge number that is like reported statistics showing how the, the rate of conversion for mild cognitive impairment to Alzheimer's disease. So we wanted to see if we can step back and look into kind of a preclinical population if we would still see these very dramatic effects. So mild cognitive impairment is diagnosed if patients have normal MMSE, that cognitive measure I showed you, but report memory or cognitive problems. And most, and now A means they have memory problems, most amnestic MCI patients progress to AD. But there's two subtypes. Some MCI, some amnestic MCI patients only report that uh, memory problems. They can't remember where they put their keys, they can't remember that they just went to the store, and so on. And that's called single domain. They only have memory problems. But some amnestic MCI patients 
are called multiple domain because they report memory problems plus something else. And what that something else is tends to be executive function problems. So we had all together 111 patients and they broke down like this. Single domain, only reporting memory problems, a lot of monolinguals, not so many bilinguals. It's really hard to find these people. Multiple domain, memory plus executive control problems, about 20 in each group. Okay? So the approach here is the same. We want to know when they're diagnosed. At what age do we see these problems? And again, uh, if, this, if AMCI converts to Alzheimer's disease, we would think the pattern would be the same. And they're equivalent on everything. All right, so those are the data I showed you before. Here are the data for single domain AMCI. They only have memory problems, okay? It's exactly what you'd expect. The bilinguals are nicely old. Here are the data for multiple domain MCI. They have memory problems plus executive control problems. The advantage disappears. Why? Where did it go? This suggests that if you compromise the executive function system, as, is, as happens in multiple domain AMCI, the bilinguals lose their compensating advantage. The reason they were doing so well is that enhanced executive control system was compensating for everything else that was falling apart. If you take that away, it's gone. Finally, there's two, two studies left. Um, so we're getting to the end here. How does this work? There's two ways that this bilingual advantage can protect patients against dementia. One thing is what I call the disease model. Maybe bilingual brains are just healthier. So they, they're kind of, bilingualism is a kind of inoculation against these diseases, these neurodegenerative diseases, and they just don't get the disease. And the reason bilinguals are older when they finally succumb is because their brains have staved off the disease. That means that if you look in the brains of monolingual and bilingual patients, for any level of disease burden, you'll have the same cognitive level. The bilinguals were just a little older when they got the disease. Alternatively, it could work at the level of the symptoms. That means the disease is there, but the bilinguals cope with the disease. So as the brain is succumbing to all those beta amyloid plaques and tangles, the bilingual brain pulls in this reserve, this compensating system, and allows the person to function even though the disease is there. Then the explanation would be be that the bilinguals are older, not because they didn't get the disease, but because they have the disease, but they can deal with it, all right? Those are the two possibilities, which is it? So we did a study with 20 monolinguals and 20 bilinguals who are exactly the same age, exactly the same cognitive level, all probable AD, everything about them is identical. These 40 people go see the neurologist, and the neurologist would say they're all identical. Okay. Half of them are bilingual. And then we looked at their brains. Now, there's two ways to, to get brain data in this case. One important brain measure is overall atrophy, because I'm sorry to say, as we get older, our brains crumble and dissolve and atrophy. So older brains are smaller. For that reason, we made sure that all the patients in this sample are exactly the same age. We selected them to be the same age. And when we look at general brain volumetrics, everybody's exactly the same. 
I said earlier that Alzheimer's disease is a memory disease. And the reason is that these beta amyloid plaques actually take hold right here in the medial temporal lobe, um, I'll show you that later, uh, where the hippocampus is. So the hippocampus undergoes specific atrophy. So if you look at hippocampal volume or medial temporal volume in Alzheimer's disease, it's quite severe. And there are published studies showing how by measuring these things, and in particular, you see there's a space between these two lines. This is called the radial width of the temporal horn. That number is taken as a proxy for disease severity. The larger the radial width, the more disease, okay? So we measure it in all these people, and now for all three measures of medial temporal atrophy, the bilinguals have significantly more atrophy, significantly more atrophy. They have worse brains. They have more disease, significantly more disease. And yet, they're functioning at the same cognitive level as monolinguals with less disease. So they're compensating. They have the campus, okay? So they have more disease, they cope better with the impairment, so there's some compensation probably from this executive control system. How? And this is my last slide, and this is entirely speculative, but again, it's brought to you by the great Gigi Look, who measured not gray matter, not volume, but white matter, which is the fatty stuff that covers all the neurons that is required to transmit signals through the brain. And like everything else, as we get older, it dissolves. So Gigi's idea was to compare white matter connectivity in monolinguals and bilinguals. These are not patients. These are healthy older adults. Uh, I'm not going to bother you with all that stuff. But anyway, these, these measures increase with aging, showing the, uh, the loss of connectivity in those measures. And what she found is in 14 monolingual and 14 bilingual 70-year-olds, matched on many things, there were large significant white matter differences showing the pathways from the front part of the brain to the middle part of the brain, that's the executive control system, were more intact in bilinguals. So by the, by the executive control network measured as conductivity was more intact in bilinguals. So that's a hint, it's not evidence at this point, but it's a hint that something in the executive control system indeed is compensating. So conclusions, we've seen that bilingualism modifies these cognitive networks. And there's now evidence for experience-related plasticity that doesn't uh, depend on this circular argument. These people were not pre-selected, and, and the modification, the outcome, was found in a different domain. He's, being bilingual doesn't make you better at speaking. It makes you better at other things. So this is a powerful demonstration of the effect of experience on mind and brain. And I completely lost my voice now, <laughs> so I'll just end with thank you very much.